cardiac cycle. Okay, and again, the normal heart rate, the beats per minute is 60 to 100 beats per minute. And of course that's at rest. So again, like I may have mentioned, if your heart rate is below 60 and you're an athlete, that's completely fine. Some athletes have a resting heart rate of somewhere in the low 40s. But again, if it's less than 60, it's called bradycardia. Now, for someone who, who doesn't have great stroke volume, the amount of blood is not in great cardiac, cardiovascular health, health, the bradycardia can give you a lower cardiac output. And, and really what, what, what the problem is, you wanna get the oxygenated blood out of your heart to every tissue, especially, especially the brain. So if the heart rate goes below 60, that's a problem. And we'll talk about blood pressure. Blood pressure goes below say 90 over 60. That's gonna be very low cardiac output. If it's greater than 100, it's called tachycardia. Now this is a problem too. Remember, this is all at rest. Having a resting heart rate that's tachycardic increases the demand of your cardiac muscle cells for oxygen, glucose, or anything else that they need to make ATP for contraction. Remember, heart muscle is beating and contracting over and over, 75 times per minute, say, your whole life since you're about 12 weeks into an embryo or into, into gestation. And it doesn't stop till you're dead, right? So this needs constant fuel through glucose. So it can use other things. It can use fatty acids to make ATP convert it to glucose. Skeletal muscle, the, mu the muscles we use just to exercise and do all the voluntary action, they can get some rest. They get a chance to replenish the oxygen and the glycogen into those cells. But the, the heart really doesn't have that kind of time. So it has to keep beating rhythmically. And you might've heard me say on the, um, the previous lecture that cardiac muscle, which is the heart really, it's made of muscle and other things, has what's called automaticity means it could start its own action potentials. And there's about four different pacemakers in the heart or pacemaker cells, but there's two main ones. If you might've heard me say the sinoatrial node, the SA node is the main pacemaker. So we'll talk about that when we do the EKG part, the ECG. So again, the cardiac cycle, you have two parts, basically. Basically you have two parts, there is more, but I want, I want you to understand these things. It's repeating, it's nonstop, you know, rhythmic with order rhythmicity. It has contractions in relaxation. So the contraction of the heart is called systole. And then when it's relaxing, it's called diastole. And remember, if I pointed this out in the last lecture, that the heart contracts from top to bottom. So the atria are going through systole as the ventricles are in diastole. And diastole, especially for the ventricles, takes a little bit longer. It takes a little bit longer because you wanna fill those ventricles. They're larger chambers. I think I made my point clear with that left ventricle. You remember Jimi Hendrix, right? So after the ventricles fill, you have what's called EDV. And that's your end diastolic volume. And let's face it, we're talking about the left ventricle mostly here. That's really what we're measuring, but it happens in both, as you saw. So the volume, hopefully in, in the range of maybe 135 milliliters is what we wanna have. Now an athlete's gonna get better and they're gonna be able to, to get that blood out faster and then their resting heart rate will be slower. But we're talking about normal um, people, maybe people that are prone to problems. And then after ejection, of the blood from the ventricle, especially left ventricles, you're left with a little bit of a volume and that's called the end systolic volume, All right? So 
even after the the ejection of blood out of the left ventricle, you're still left with a volume. So let's say it's about 135 EDV milliliters. And what's left in the ventricle after ejection is say 65 milliliters. So, so that blood stays in the, the ventricles and it keeps the volume in there. It keeps the pressure building up. So now it's gonna to start to fill again, right? So basically it'll start with atrial filling then atrial systole, and during atrial uh, systole, that's when the ventricles are filling. So the ventricles also go through diastole, and then there's ventricular systole, and then ejection of blood into the aorta, okay? So this is just talking about how the, again, this is kind of confusing, but look at the timing within that 0.8 seconds, right? Based on a 75 uh, beat per minute heart rate. Systole is quicker because you need time to build up that end diastolic volume and the pressure within the ventricles. So you can have a good ejection and stroke volume. Stroke volume is the blood that's injected from the ventricle. I know I keep saying ventrally. I know there's two, but we're really talking about the left ventricle. And that's about, let's say 70 milliliters. So basically if you subtract the end, the end systolic volume from the end diastolic volume, you're gonna get your stroke volume. And, and let's, let's stop the mystery. But let me tell you the whole thing, what we're, what we're really talking about here. Cardiac output, and this is important. Cardiac output is how much blood you can get out of your ventricles in a minute. So cardiac output equals your stroke volume times your heart rate. Really important. So based on like 70 or so milliliters stroke volume and a 75 uh, beat per minute heart rate, your cardiac output would wind up being, let's say five liters around five liters of blood per minute. And that's pretty good. That's pretty good getting that five liters into your heart, out to the lungs and all the oxygenated blood to your systemic circuit every minute. That would you'd be really in good shape there. But of course with cardiovascular health, you could increase your maximum cardiac output and build up a cardiac reserve. That's how you get in great shape when you're in cardiovascular shape. But again, not everybody is like that and, and hearts get sick. Like say, and this is a, a really important takeaway. Let's say there's a problem with your heart, whether it be a valve problem or cardiomyopathy where there's a problem, a sickness in the heart muscle itself. That's gonna affect the stroke volume. It's, it's gonna affect ventricular filling. You could have problem with venous return coming back to the right atrium. So whenever a heart is sick and the stroke volume is low, what has to go up? The heart rate, right? So the heart rate is increasing, increasing, and that is not healthy. So most sick hearts, not only are they sick, but they're in tachycardia, which is more demand. So it's kind of like a snowball effect. And what increases the heart rate? What part of the nervous system? I bet you could tell me after all we talked about. I don't have to go back to me eating my burrito in Central Park. It's a sympathetic nervous system, right? The sympathetic nervous system will notice a drop in cardiac output and try to speed up the heart to improve that, to get the oxygenated blood to the brain, right? So I believe what this circle thing is telling you is that as the ventricles are in diastole, the, the atria are going through systole and then vice versa. And it's a little bit longer in ventricular diastole. That's the takeaway from here, besides all this cardiac output stuff I'm telling you about. So it's all about pressures, right? Pressures, because the ventri ventricles are filling, right? And that means the atrioventricular valves, which you learned from the last recording, atrioventricular valves have to be open, of course, as they're filling. And once <coughs> there's enough blood in the ventricles, the pressure in the ventricles is gonna over overcome the pressure in the atria, even though the atria contracted to get that last bit of blood into the ventricles. And what happens? The AV valve slams shut. 
And that's the S1, the first sound, right? Like the beating, the, the, the two sounds for one heartbeat. So the first one is the closure of the atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve. <coughs> so now the pressure is building up in the ventricles. And now we have the outflow valves, the semilunar outflow valves, like the pulmonary uh, uh, valve and the aortic valve. So the pr pressure is building up in the ventricles because the valves, the AV valves are closed. And now is the tricky part. The pressure in the ventricles, the blood in the ventricles and the ventricles themselves <coughs> have to overcome the pressure in the aorta, the left ventricle I'm talking about mostly. So if there's enough pressure to open those valves, that's what happens. They will open and then the blood is ejected. And once the blood is ejected, you don't want backflow, right? I might've told you in the last one that valves prevent regurgitation, backflow, retrograde flow. So the semilunar valves, the outflow valves close, and that's where you get the S2, the second sound. Then there's a short period, extremely short, less than uh, 0 0.04 seconds, where you have all the valves are closed after ejection and that's called isovolumetric relaxation and then it'll all start again where the vent the atria will fill the venous return into the right atrium and blood coming back from the lungs in the left atrium right so on the on this wiggers diagram which is probably the most confusing diagram you'll see in this class there's a dichrotic notch sounds like a scary word and really all that means is that the pressure from the aorta is going to splash back on the onto the ventricles and that happens during isovolumetric relaxation it's a little bit of a, a backflow but it's prevented from going into the left atrium i'm sorry left ventricle from the aortic semilunar outflow valve so that slightly changes the pressure for again very short period of time so when you see the dichrotic notch it's really about a little drop in pressure after ejection. So now it starts again, pressure in the ventricles falls below because the atrial pressure has to build up first though. So you have to have atrial filling, right? Atrium, left atrium. And of course, when that's happening during atrial uh, diastole, the atria are filling with blood. And now the pressure in the atria is higher than the pressure in the ventricle, even, even though you still have that end uh, systolic volume in there. But still, the atrial pressure will overcome the ventricular pressure, and that will force the valves open. And the blood just goes down due to gravity, pretty much, and pressure, really pressure, not so much gravity. And then the atria contract, atrial systole. And that pretty much brings in the rest of the blood into the ventricles. So again, somebody in good cardiovascular condition, that atrial systole is sometimes makes the difference in your cardiac output that lasts. It's about maybe the last 20 to 30% of the blood in the atria will be, will go into the ventricles when the atria contract. So really the, atri the ventricles are filling because of pressure, not so much contraction, but there is that 20 to 30% of blood that's enters the ventricles after or during atrial systole. And that's the last bit. And so I would say that last bit of blood is about 20 to 30%. And the higher, the better. I can squeeze all that blood into the ventricles. Because think about when you exercise, you really need, you don't have a lot of time because when you're exercising, your heart rate can go to 180 beats per minute. That doesn't give you a lot of time for filling, right? Because we're talking, we're, we're talking about rest at rest 75 beats per minute, but during exercise, you're up around 180 for your target heart rate at your age. So the healthier all this is, the better that atrial systole and this last bit of blood getting in there and the end diastolic volume, the better cardiovascular health you'll be in. So this is crazy what goes on here. Let me see if I got a better way to describe this. So again, I can't say this too great, but you're looking at different volumes and pressure from left to right. So um, the volume changes, of course. So the, the purple is the volume in the ventricle, right? The blue is the pressure in the ventricle, 
right? So it goes through these phases. Like first you'll have atrial filling, then atrial systole. So right here, you have to have opening of the valves and that's systole, opening of the semilunar outflow valves, of course, because the, the pressure in the ventricles was greater than the pressure in the aorta. Now that's aortic pressure, right? So the first thing, again, this is really hard to describe. This looks really small. But the first thing is your isovolumetric contraction. Now, I mentioned isovolumetric relaxation before, which is after ejection. But there's another period when all the valves are closed called isovolumetric um, contraction. And that's right here where everything's closed. Because now the aortic had went through systole. It, it, the filling of the ventricles is at its highest right about here. And now you could eject the blood because the, right here, this is where ejection happens because the ventricular pressure overcame the pressure in the aorta. See, they're not showing you the aortic pressure here if I can see that right. Because the aortic pressure is gonna go up right about here. So you have to overcome that to have ejection. And then you have that period of isovolumetric relaxation where all the valves are closed again, right? And then you have the filling of the ventricles. So then the volume, of course, is gonna increase. Oh, here it is. Here's the aorta, sorry. The aorta is right here. Well, they call it artery, but that's aorta. Okay, and then it fills again and then goes back to atrial contraction and then starts again with isovolumetric contraction. So that's one heartbeat, but it really has five phases. Sometimes I like to start with atrial contraction first. So all that has to happen in 0.8 seconds due to the changes in pressure. And this is the dichrotic notch right here where that, that volume and pressure just decreases a little bit. That pressure change just decreases a little bit. And here you can see this, this drop is during injection because the ventricular blood is leaving the ventricle. And then it goes back up and it all starts like right here, starts again. So you have increase in volume, increase in pressure, you overcome the aortic pressure and then you have opening of the semilunar valves and then ejection. And then it closes and slams shut. So the first sound you hear when the AV valves close after the ventricles are filled the second sound is closure of the semilunar valves after ejection. And that's when that blood splashes back onto the aortic valve. It's very complicated. So again, it doesn't go through each one of them. So again, just, just learn the, the stages in here. And hopefully you kind of followed along last time, or last week's recording where, where this all has to happen at one time. Let me see if I can explain this a little bit better. So every minute you want five liters of blood to go in your heart and then out. So you need to, one really important thing. You need venous return from the, from the veins, right? You have to get the blood back to the right atrium because the blood in the left atrium is just coming back from the lungs. So how do we get venous return? How do we get blood back to the right atrium in a timely fashion? And that's called venous return. So one way is that your, your veins, especially peripheral veins have valves in them that keeps blood moving in that anterograde direction. Because remember your legs are below your heart. So you could be fighting against gravity there. Or even if you're laying down, you still have to, it has to make a trip from your peripheral veins in your legs back to the right atrium. So another way is skeletal muscle contraction. Right? When, you, when you contract your skeletal muscles, you, just walking, moving, exercising, of course, is gonna pump the blood from the veins back to the right atrium. And that's really important. That's why people who don't move a lot and, and are prone to blood clots, right, are gonna have more problems with edema and blood clotting if they don't get venous return or they don't move. So the more you're stuck in, a, in the same position for a long time, the more likely you're gonna have stasis of blood. Now, I'm not saying just because you sit around all day, you're going to have a blood clot, but if you're prone to them and you do that every day for 10 years, then you're going to have stasis of blood in the, in the extremities. 
Another way you get blood back into the right atrium from the systemic veins is through your, the, your breathing, right? Your diaphragm goes up and down, kind of draws the blood back up, believe it or not. And remember that big, uh, not artery, but the big vessels, veins that drain into the right atrium, the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. I'm sure I mentioned that on the recording. So every time you breathe, they kind of get pushed back and they, it forms like a, a siphon, a suction of the blood into the right atrium. So venous return is very important. So now that, that all has to happen at one time. All the blood has to come into the atria, both sides at the same time. And it has to be an increase in volume in the atria because the, whenever you put more blood into a container like the atria, it's gonna increase the pressure. So of course the AV valves have to be have to be closed at that point, right? They have to be closed because their atria is filling. So now when the pressure of the atria overcomes the pressure in the ventricles, there's a split second called isovolumetric um, relaxation that when all the valves are closed, but then the valves will open, the AV valves will open and the ventricles will fill at the same time, left and right. Now, the ventricles will begin to fill due to pressure change. And then the atria will contract first, systole. And that'll force the rest of the blood into the ventricles. And then once the pressure in the ventricles overcomes the atria, the AV valve slams shut. And that's the first sound of the lub-dub, 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 shutting of the AV valves. So now we got good pressure in the, um, in the ventricles and then the pressure in the ventricles is so high that it overcomes the pressure in the aorta outside the left ventricle. And of course, going into the lungs from the right ventricle. And then the semi valves will open and then you have ejection. And then the, the semi valves will slam shut to avoid any backflow into the ventricles. And that's the second sound, that's S2, dub, dub, blub, dub. Second sound is closure of the um, semi outflow valves. And then you have a period within that area called isovolumetric contraction. Because I, I, I forgot to mention one thing, before ejection, you have ventricular systole. That's a big deal, ventricular systole. You know, that has to happen. I forgot to mention that most important part of it. So ventricular systole means the, the muscles are contracting in the ventricles, the cardiomyocytes. And that's what pumps the blood out of the heart. The ejection is pretty much driven by ventricular systole. And the timing has to be perfect. So the, the heart has its own electrical system that, that causes all this. Like you'll see that the atria has, will, will depolarize. Now I'm gonna talk about nervous tissue now. The atria depolarize before the ventricles. That makes sense, right? Because if you have depolarization, then you have action potential, then you get the contraction. And then it has to repolarize too. And then while that's happening in the atria, the ventricles are beginning to depolarize. And then they have an action potential and then they have a contraction. So it has to happen in the atria first, the electrical part and the systole. And then it happens in the ventricle, the electrical part, then the systole. systole. The electrical part is depolarization, action potential and repolarization. So all those ions we talked about in the nervous system are just as important here, like sodium influx causes depolarization. Potassium outflux causes repolarization, right? Potassium. And then calcium is really important. Now this, I might not have talked about too much, but hopefully I did. We talked about neurotransmitters, but calcium is really important for muscles to contract. You need calcium to bind to certain proteins in muscle that cause contraction. So you have to have homeostatic levels of calcium in order to get a good ventricular systole. So all those things are important with the flow of blood, with the pressures that are involved. So where were we? Huh? Did I stop sharing? So that's called the Wiggers diagram, which is very confusing, even, even when it's got a better picture to show you. So let's talk about the electrical activity of the heart. And now we're gonna talk about the uh, automaticity and some of the histology right here. Like mu a muscle tissue, there's three different types of muscle. There's a cardiac muscle, there's 
your smooth muscle, which is in your blood vessels, and then your, your skeletal muscle, which is the voluntary muscle that we use uh, to move our, our joints. That's voluntary, but of course, cardiac and smooth are not voluntary. So they have different histology. And of course, there's gap junctions between these cells. I don't know why I said of course, but, but there is because they have to have ion flow. So this is a hallmark, and you should remember this. What's gap junctions are in these structures between muscle cells in the heart called intercalated discs. And they are pro protein uh, tubules really that carry ions like sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium. So this is a hallmark of the histology, the tissue of cardiac muscle. So this allows that ion flow from one cell to the next. Because remember the heart has to, it has to contract in this functional syncytium, like top to bottom. So the blood is being uh, pumped downward and then up and outward. And the timings is crucial for this to happen homeostatically. Yeah. So the functional syncytium is the way the myocardium contracts in concert. And through this automaticity, this depolarization that starts in the right ventricle, I'm sorry, in the right atrium. So I, I might have mentioned this in the in the recording last week, but you know, most of the heart is muscle, but it's kind of separated by fibrous skeleton, which is connective tissue that's dense, irregular connective tissue that kind of separates the, the chambers. And of course, the valves are made of this as well. So there's no conduction through this connective tissue. So it has to be done through these pacemakers, which you'll see. And the main pace, pacemaker of the heart is the uh, SA node, which is the sinoatrial node. And then there's an AV node called the atrioventricular node. But know this, all the cells of the heart, the atrial cells and the ventricular cells outside of the nodes all have automaticity. They can all start uh, an action potential to make this heart survive. That's how crazy this is, all right? So automaticity, and it has its own. Like, again, if I, if I took your heart out and I put it in an isotonic solution, it will continue to, to beat as long as you can stimulate it somehow with ions because right? it has its own pacemaking potential. And of course, you got to give it the, the other nutrients too. So the SA node is the starter. Like you might hear something like sinus rhythm or normal sinus rhythm. You know, you watch Grey's Anatomy, whatever. So normal sinus rhythm is coming from the SA node and that's exactly what we want. In fact, the SA node could set a heart rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute, which is great for the left ventricle if it gets there. So this has to be intact, this main pacemaker of the heart. And then below that, still in the right atrium, and it's kind of like at the top of the, the bottom of the right atrium, right before the ventricles, that's why they call it the AV node, is another pacemaker. So the AV node kind of slows things down. Like the AV, the SA node could be cranking out your action potentials. So the AV node slows down the action potentials. And the reason for that is, is to allow for ventricular filling, allowing that time, because you don't want tachycardia. Again, the heart doesn't want that. It has to sometimes, and the sympathetic nervous system tells it to. But this AV node creates this little delay, and you'll see it on the EKG, which is completely appropriate between atrial depolarization and ventricular depolarization. So remember, depolarization is the sodium influx excitation to action potential. So the atria have to depolarize, and then the ventricles have to depolarize in that order. Whew. Okay, now Purkinje fibers, I like this term, Purkinje fibers, are basically in the myocardium of the ventricles. So Purkinje fibers are nerve fibers that cause ventricular depolarization because the SA node and the AV node are in the atria. So the signal is sent into the interventricular septum, which you saw last week, and then spread throughout the myocardium to the lateral walls and the apex of the heart via these Purkinje fibers. And these are pacemaker too. These are pacemakers too. So again, you want sinus rhythm, which is coming from the SA node, which can pump out about 60 to 100 beats per minute action. Or I should say action potentials per minute. 
because really that's what it does. It gives 60 to 100 action potentials, which correlate into beats per minute. So here's what happens, right? First, you have SA node depolarization action potential. Then you have your atrial cells. See, your book might not say this. Your atrial cells will depolarize action potential. Then after that, you have your AV node action potential. And then you'll have your ventricular, which are really Purkinje cells. Okay, so the every one of these areas, and these are really the pacemakers, have automaticity. So this is this is the thing. This is the thing that and they're talking about what's called ectopic pacemakers, which is an excellent topic. Excellent, excellent topic. Get it? Ectopic topic. So ectopic means something is occurring where it shouldn't be. Like you might have heard of ectopic pregnancy, where you're supposed to have an implantation in your endometrium, but it happens in the fallopian tube. It's an ectopic focus. So let's say you have a problem with your SA node. The SA node is dysfunctional. Who, who's gonna take over? The atria will take over because that's the next highest rhythm. Because the SA node can do about 60 to 100. The atrial cells can do about um, 60 to 80. So now the atrial pacemaker cells, the actual myocardium, pacemaker myocardium of the atria takes over and it's a little bit slower. So that might affect your cardiac output. And plus the atria are not built to do this without the SA node. So an ectopic focus in the atria can go crazy. Like this, this can get, even though it only puts out 60 to 80, it's, it's struggling to do that. So it might go into its own tachycardia, which is just atrial tachycardia. So if the atria starts going crazy, firing off too many action potentials, you're gonna get what's called atrial flutter, which could lead to what's called atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation is a massive amount of action potentials at the H in the atria because the SA node is not working. That's an arrhythmia. You might not even know you have that if, you're, if your heart rate is maintained, your ventricular heart rate is maintained between 60 and 100, it stays below 100. If, if, you're, tach, if you're in tachycardia because of this, you, you might have to have an EKG and have it checked out. So when you have an ectopic focus, that's where things like atrial fibrillation happen, which is a potentially dangerous thing that can cause embolisms and heart attack, right? Um, of course, the embolism can cause, cause a stroke. So, but the weird thing is, even though the atria has gone crazy because there's no SA node, the AV node saves the day and allows a good ventricular output. That's what you have to understand. Even though the atria is going nuts, fibrillation, ectopic focus, pacemaker, the AV node will slow all that down because that's what the AV node does. It slows down the action potentials. It gathers it up and, and puts it into the ventricle, sends that signal to the ventricles. Like the ventricles don't even know what's going on in the atria. They just think everything's normal and they could beat at 60 to 100 beats per minute or, or around 100 if this is going on. So, because ultimately it's all about ventricular systole. Let's face it, the left ventricle has all that work to do, that thick myocardium, and it has the job to pump all that oxygenated blood into the whole body. So it's all, ultimately all this is about ventricular systole, which includes your stroke volume and which helps you with your cardiac output. So the AV node saves that day. Now, if the atrial cells aren't working, then the AV node has to take over and that only pumps out about 40 to 60 action potentials. So now you're gonna have very low heart rate and this could create a problem, of course, but still the ventricular output is normal. And that's really what we're testing. Like when I started this um, lecture today, I said that the normal resting heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. That's ventricular because the atrial cells and the ventricle cells have two different systoles, right? So you could have an atrial heart rate of 250 and still have 100 beats per minute ventricular because the AV node fixes that. Now, if the AV node is in trouble, like our AV block, they call that heart block, then you're going to have a problem with the ventricles and 
you're going to wind up skipping ventricular beats and you have a really bad arrhythmia that has to be treated. And if you get to that point, you basically need an artificial pacemaker to take over for the SA node and they, they, they will install that, uh, which actually starts the action potentials you know, from a little transistor that they install in your, hyper, uh, your hypodermis um, or your subcutaneous tissue in your chest because you, you want to get ventricular output. So any of these arrhythmias caused by this are, are treated with an artificial pacemaker, of course. Now let's say all of these nodes aren't working and the ventricles have to do their own beating and pacemaking and action potential. The ventricular cells like the Purkinje fibers and the myocardium, the ventricles can only pump out about 20 to 40 beats per minute or action potentials per minute. And that is not sustainable to life. You can't get cardiac output with this low of a heart rate if the ventricles are doing all the work. So what happens to the ventricles, they go into fibrillation to try to do whatever they can to increase the heart rate and get cardiac output. But then ventricular fibrillation, well, first you get ventricular tachycardia, which is bad in its own way. And it's coming from the ventricles, which is, you know, you're, you're in big trouble. And if you have ventricular fibrillation, then you are really in trouble. That means that the ventricles are just twitching to try to get blood out into the aorta, anything they can. So this is where you have to be defibrillated. You have to put a defibrillator on that and reset this whole electrical system and hopefully wake this guy up, the SA node, if possible. Assuming that these are okay though, but of course, if the SA node is not working, you have to go through this process of suppression of the slower heart rate. So the pacemaker, the fastest pacemaker will start the rhythm. So if the SA node is not working, atria will pick up. If the atria and SA node are not waking, working, the AV will pick up. If all three are not working, then the ventricles have to pick up. You don't want that. That's a very sick heart right there. Okay, I know that's confusing, but again, it's the electrical system. So the pacemaking potential, again, starts in the SA node and that's where we want it to start because that would be sinus rhythm or normal sinus rhythm. And it's spontaneous. So it has these sodium channels that are always ready to fly. They're always ready to let sodium in, All right? So it's, it's a depolarization, of course, that happens in ventricular diastole, right? In between heartbeats, of course. So you want that spontaneous, okay, triggered by hyperpolarization. Don't worry about that. So again, this is a little different. Um, with the action potentials of the heart versus the neuron. Of course, it's just a little different. So at 40, negative 40 millivolts of the membrane of the heart muscle cells, the calcium channels open and that's what triggers a, a contraction, right? A contraction, of course, sodium has to be involved too. So you have sodium channels for depolarization and repolarization happens with your opening of the uh, potassium channels, okay? So this is kind of what it looks like. Again, the, the, the resting membrane potential is a little bit lower. It's at minus 60 millivolts, not minus 70 millivolts. And you have depolarization. Again, it's not telling you that, but you have sodium has to influx for this to happen. And once you get that bit of depolarization, then the, then the calcium channels could open and the calcium comes into the cell, which binds to proteins within the muscle fibers that cause contraction. So that has an action potential. And these are pacemakers. They kind of just go up and then come straight down, just like a neuron, except just slightly different numbers. Like you see the action potential peaks out at plus 20. So this is, this is a pacemaker. This is what happens in the SA node and the AV node mostly, and, and, and the atrial cells as well. Because a lot of books forget to talk about the atrial cells because they have their own automaticity as well. So each one of these is an action potential. Like if this was here, two, three, and there's a timing between those. You know, there's a timing between those action potentials, which is appropriate because you have to repolarize in order to get another good depolarization action potential. It has to repolarize every time it has to. And sometimes it could hyperpolarize, and like we talked about in neural, where that slows down everything because it, during hyperpolarization, you're in a period called refractory where you can't really get it another action potential. So this relative and absolute. So the refractory period in the heart is crucial. 
Because if you have an action potential inappropriately within that refractory period and it allows for an action potential, your heart can go into defib or can go into fibrillation that needs to be defibrillated. So it's kind of crazy, right? Kind of crazy how, how succinct and how this functional succidium has to work with the right timing. So let's start it. Let's see the pacemaker cells, like, and you show the action potentials in the SA node. That's what sinal atrial, SA node means, sinal atrial node. So that's a spontaneous, right? But they can be modulated. Like, again, I told you, if I took your heart out, I could put it in a, an isotonic solution and keep feeding it, and then it'll continue to beat. So what controls the heart rate or modulates it, speeds it up or slows it down? So sympathetic, right? Where's the word sympathetic? Sympathetic nervous system autonomic will release the epinephrine or norepinephrine to the SA node, right? And it increases, of course, this second messenger here, which we believe we talked about before because it's been so much. Second messenger of cyclic AMP because it involves a receptor, an adrenergic, and these are beta one adrenergic receptors on the SA node. So the channels are open for sodium and, and calcium. So epinephrine is going to increase the action potentials at the SA node when needed during exercise, right? During when you exercise, you need your heart to pump faster and stronger. So epinephrine is released from the sympathetic nervous system. When I'm eating a a burrito and the bear comes and I go into sympathetic, the epinephrine, norepinephrine is released to the beta one receptors on the SA node and increases my heart rate. So don't worry too much about hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channels, right? These, the point is these are very sensitive. These are very sensitive to change. So you, you have to have a refractory period. And of course, Sodium inflow is going to increase depolarization and increase action potential, All right? It's going to increase action potential, which increases your heart rate. I think that's the easiest way to understand this. Now, parasympathetic, especially cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve, like vagal, the vagus nerve will release acetylcholine to the pacemakers like the AV node and the SA node, but that's all they do. Like epinephrine, sympathetic, it affects the nodes, the SA node and the AV node to increase heart rate, but it also affects the cardiac muscle to contract stronger, where your parasympathetic, which releases, of course, acetylcholine to the cholinergic, muscarinic receptors of the SA node and the AV node, Parasympathetic stimulation only affects the nodes and heart rate. It does not affect the contractility of the heart. So there's, you, can't, you can't relax the heart. You can only speed it up with sympathetic. You can't slow it down. Uh, you can't, I shouldn't say speed it up. You can't make it contract stronger with anything but sympathetic. So parasympathetic doesn't make it contract less strong. It just slows the heart rate down by affecting the SA node and the AV node. So the autonomic nervous system from the medulla oblongata is where the cardiac centers are for heart rate. Controls or modulates, like they say, I like that. That's a good um, way to say it. It modulates like how, how much action potentials you're gonna get from these, these cells, like the AV node, SA node and the atrial cells and the ventricles. So it's autonomic, of course, you can't control this with your mind, right? The somatic, that's skeletal muscle. So now these are different muscles now. The last page was about, um, was about pacemakers, like the pacemakers of the atrium, the uh, SA node and the AV node and the atrial cells. But now we're talking more about the cardiac muscle and the ventricles. And that has a different action potential chart or curve, if you will. So this is the one I want you to know the most actually, because cardiac muscle cells have a rest of the membrane potential that's minus 85. Like that's different than the neuron. And it's different than skeletal muscle too. So this is what we want to depolarize, which just makes it more positive. And there's a threshold, just like the neuron. But this is cardiac muscle. So if they're depolarized, enough sodium comes in to make this less negative to, to a threshold, then you get action potential. 
and that's at the SA node or from the SA node. But again, the SA node is causing the depolarization of the cardiac muscles, right? It's the SA node that sends the signal to the atrial cells and then to the AV node and then to the myocardial cells. So technically these are different cells, these are ventricular. So in depolarization, you know that the fast sodium channel is open and it plateaus of course very quickly to minus 15, which is much more positive than minus 85. So calcium is slow in flux, slow, but sodium is fast in flux. Now I know there's gonna be a good chart on here to help you to see what this looks like. And then efflux of potassium has everything to do with repolarization and maybe even hyperpolarization. All right, so potassium, of course, again, is about repolarization. But in this, you don't have like, remember the, the action potential of the muscle, I'm sorry, of the neuron kind of just goes up and down, right? And just like the, the pacemaker cells. But these are going to be different. These are going to have more of a plateau and then come down slow because you need this again because you need to sustain that contraction. Again, allowing flow into the, or filling of the ventricles. So again, prevents summation and tetanus. So you don't want tetanus in the heart. Tetanus, again, we're not talking about the bacteria tetanus. Tetanus in the skeletal muscle makes complete sense with postural muscles and maintaining the muscle tone, but the heart can't go into tetanus. It can't keep going. Or else again, you're gonna have cardiac arrest and you have no cardiac output. So it has to be running smoothly. So basically the, the influx, again, the resting membrane potential is about minus 85. And I think it's around 65 is the, minus 65 is the threshold around there. And then you have action potential, of course, which peaks out towards 120. Now it doesn't come right down because of the calcium starts to come in after or during the action potential. So it elongates the contraction, the systole, just a little bit longer. Because again, you have to have a functional syncytium, you have to have a good contraction during systole. So calcium is all about the muscles getting a nice, smooth contraction, not tetanus, but a nice sustained contraction to get that blood out of the ventricle and into the aorta to get oxygenated blood to every cell in the body. So this is the plateau. This is called the plateau right here. So slow calcium channels. This is fast sodium channels in, right? This happens really fast. And then potassium will come out and then it'll repolarize it back to resting membrane potential. So now you gotta think about this now, because I, I keep mentioning that this timing has to be perfect. You don't want hyper or too much sodium coming in too easy because it's gonna make a jumpy heart and arrhythmia or tachycardia. You want good calcium flowing in so you get a good contraction and you wanna repolarize it. So you wanna get that potassium out. But sometimes you have a sick heart and sodium is coming in too fast. Because remember I told you, if you have a sick heart, most of the time you're gonna be in tachycardia. So a lot of the medications that are given, like beta blockers, right, are going to slow down the heart. That's an obvious one. It stops epinephrine from causing increased action potentials at the SA node or the AV node or the myocardial cells. But sometimes you want to block sodium channels to slow those down a little bit, to slow down the heart rate. Sometimes you want to keep potassium in a little bit to sustain a little bit more of a contraction and help it get a little bit stronger and then potassium come, come out slower. In a really sick heart, you don't want too much calcium to come in because think of it this way, if you, if you have a sick heart and calcium is coming in too fast, it's gonna make the heart contract too much, too strong and cause more demand. So sometimes they have to decrease the amount of calcium that comes in. There's, there's a medication called the Joxin or Lenox and that it's kind of dangerous though, because I mean, it works, it, it stops the demand by lowering the amount of calcium that comes into the cell. But it also can, can if you're given the wrong dose can create problems. So we use it to treat cardiomyopathies or, or heart failure, but you really gotta be careful with the dosage of that. 
something like digoxin. So the medications treat different things like the sodium channels, blocking the sodium channels, blocking calcium channels, or sometimes helping potassium to come out to repolarize. So sometimes they spare potassium, sometimes they want to secrete it out of the cell. So medications are all based on these ions flowing in and affects heart rate contractility of the heart as well. Because the demand is, is, the, is the thing, because the heart is gonna demand oxygen at a tachycardic rate. So that's why it's important that the heart rate is below 100 at rest. And that heart rate is the ventricular one I'm talking about. So again, we'll go back to the conducting tissues. So again, there's gap junctions between cells and the gap junctions are inside these structures called intercalated discs. So the SA node and the atrial cells will conduct to the AV node. And ultimately after they depolarize action potential, then they cause atrial contraction. So technically that is happens first. It does happen first and that's atrial systole. completely separate from ventricular. But of course, ventricular is more important. I mean, you need this, of course. I'm not saying this is not important, but in order to get blood to my brain, I better have good ventricular systole. So the AV node is in the right atrium and right below that at the interventricular um, septum at the top between the atrium and the ventricles is an area called the bundle of Hiss or the AV bundle. So that is the conduction system between the AV node and the Purkinje cells. Like it starts, I'll just write it out for you. You see like SA node, again, to atrial cells. This is the direction of current or conduction to the AV node, to the bundle of Hiss, also known as the AV bundle. Then you go, the, the, it'll split. The bundle of Hiss will split between the left and right bundle branches. And hopefully there's a nice picture coming up with this. And the bundle branches will kind of branch out into the whole myocardium through the Purkinje fibers. I just like that word, Purkinje. Purkinje cells, Purkinje fibers, it all means the same thing. And this is where the ventricles contract with, them. oh, and this is what is the pacemakers of the ventricles, right? So you have to know, you know, this, this little tree from the SA node to atrial cells to AV node. A lot of times your books will skip the atrial cells, but they're important. AV node to bundle of Hiss, and then the bundle of Hiss will branch to the left and right bundle branches along the interventricular septum. That, that's that big piece of myocardium between the left and right ventricle, which I have to tell you, the interventricular septum really belongs to the left ventricle. And the depolarization really goes more from left to right. So those bundle branches will then branch even further into the myocardium lateral and the bottom towards the apex of the heart. So finally, here you go, now we can look at it. So here's your, what is this big blue vessel? That's your superior vena cava or cava, depends on where you're from. And then here's the inferior vena cava, just to give you some um, perspective. And this is all deoxygenated blood coming from the lower and upper body into the right atrium eventually, right here. Sorry, I can't see that. And here is the right atrium. So up top in the posterior superior lateral part of the atrium, right atrium, you have this nervous tissue node and it's called a node because the nerve tissue is actually wrapped in a connective tissue capsule kind of thing. So it's wrapped in connective tissue. So the SA node, again, the sinoatrial node, and we want everything to start here. That's normal sinus rhythm. Then the, the SA node will kind of spread the depolarization out into the atrial cells, both sides. It has to happen. And there's these branches called Bachmann's Bachmann's bundles. They help spread that depolarization throughout the atria. Because now atria filling, right? And don't forget the coronary sinus also dumps blood into the right atrium. The left atrium has blood coming from the 
pulmonary veins of the left and right lungs. And now all of that depolarization will come down to the AV node, which is right about here, it's still in the atria. Well, they call it AV because it's really the electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles. So that's the AV node, which slows down the action potentials. Completely appropriate because you want nice filling here. Then right here, you have what's called the bundle of his or the AV bundle. But to tell you the truth, it's all Purkinje fibers, but still it, it, it is an important area because this is crucial to have that conduction go to the left and right. So you have your left bundle branch here. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, you yeah, know, this is the left bundle branch. Left and right, sorry. Right and left bundle branches. Here's the other one, the right one. Go, and this is the interventricular septum, all of this. And then it's going to branch. Because remember, you want good contraction all the way through. This is the apex in the, in the lateral part. Look how thick this left lateral wall is. Because this is really where you want, this is where most of the depolarizations happen with these Purkinje fibers, because this is the key area. Again, the rock star of the heart, the rock star of the heart right here. This is not Beyonce here. This is Jimi Hendrix, right? And this is the one that's pumping all the blood into the aorta, which of course is not shown on this because the heart's cut in half in a coronal section. It shows you the Purkinje fibers too. So there you have it. That's the conduction system. It all has to happen within that 0.8 seconds based on a 75 beat per minute heart rate with a five liter per minute cardiac output and diastolic volume and systolic volume, stroke volume, and of course the heart rate. Cardiac output equals your stroke volume times your heart rate. So we don't have to know these numbers. We don't have to know these numbers. Again, the action potentials from the SA node spread rapidly, of course, to the atrial cells. And things slow down at the AV node. Like this is like the hero sometimes. Like if you have something going on in the atrial cells like fibrillation, which is an arrhythmia, the AV node is gonna straighten everything out so the ventricles can get a good systole. All right, so this is the delay. So there's a delay between atrial and ventricular contraction, of course, but don't forget before contraction, this is really important, you need depolarization. You need to depolarization. What the heck am I writing here? Polarization. Depolarization. Speed picks up at the bundle of this. Okay, good to know. All right, so of course, because you want to, that has to perpetuate all the, systole and contraction of all the ventricular muscles. Remember, Purkinje is in ventricular and they have that plateau. The muscles have the plateau, not the Purkinje fibers or nerve tissue, but the muscles have that plateau that sustained action potential. So calcium could come in and cause a really good sustained muscle contraction, not tetanus though. Go. So the, it takes about 0.3 seconds total after the atria and then diastole when the ventricles are relaxing is a little bit longer, like we said at the beginning. Really important. Remember, when I say systole, like if we're talking about systole and diastole, you have to remember, we're really talking mostly about the left ventricle. You know, even like when you're watching like uh, whatever Scrubs or Grey's Anatomy, they talk about we're in ventricular systole. You're talking about the left ventricle. Because the right ventricle only has to pump blood to the lungs. Of course, that's crucial, that's crucial. But really, if you don't get oxygen to your brain, nothing is gonna work. That's the key. So here we go. We have calcium. During that action potential, calcium is released. Now the heart relies on extracellular calcium, what's in, really, really in our blood. It goes into the extracellular space. So once the calcium gets into the cell, it travels through those T tubules that again are separated by intercality discs and the, and the action potential increases the opening of the voltage gated calcium channels, kind of like in the neuron. So it's diffusion into the cell. Sarcolemma, by the way, muscle, another term for muscle is sarco, like a prefix. Sarcolemma is the cardiac muscle membrane, just like any other plasma membrane, but bi biphospholipid.
which we really spent a lot of time on. So it's a good takeaway now. This is why you have to know all this. All right, so calcium comes into the cell and the channel's open. So here's the key. This is what I want you to remember because this, again, we're not doing a lot of musculoskeletal stuff. So here's what happens. Calcium, and it's not mostly from the SR, it's mostly from the ECF in cardiac muscle, from the sarcoplasmic reticulus and skeletal muscle. So this, we're talking about cardiac, which is true. The sarcoplasmic reticulum stores and releases calcium in the skeletal muscle, but we're talking about heart muscle. So heart muscle receives most of its calcium from the blood or ECF, extracellular fluid, which is between the muscle and the heart. So, or the, I'm sorry, the vessel in the heart, the blood vessel. So here's what happens. Calcium binds to a protein called troponin. Troponin now is a regulatory protein that allows for these other two proteins. I'm just gonna say this, allows actin and myosin to bind. So if these two bind to each other, actin and myosin, that's what shortens uh, an area in a muscle called sarcomere, which is contraction is basically shortening. So myosin and actin are kind of contracting or moving along each other's long axis. So it shortens the muscle. So troponin is a regulatory pro a protein that is bound with calcium. Calcium will, I'm sorry, troponin, once it binds with calcium, will allow actin to bind with myosin and cause contraction. And what else do you need for this? I'll tell you right now. You need a lot of this ATP. Can't do this without energy. And where do we get ATP from? Fueled with glucose in the presence of oxygen, aerobic respiration. You don't want the heart to have to undergo anaerobic respiration because then you're gonna have real problems. And if that happens, you see that in the blood, you have a problem with your heart. If you see high levels of troponin, remember LDH, we talked about enzymes, lactose, the, uh, lactate dehydrogenase. If you have to use that for anaerobic respiration in the heart, you have a problem. If you see troponin levels in the blood, that's a problem with destruction of muscle tissue in the heart, heart, heart. We're talking about the heart, right? Now the heart does have, the heart muscle does have sarcoplasmic reticulum. So after the contraction, the calcium does go into the sarcoplasmic reticulum in skeletal muscle, but really diffuses out and it's allowed out of the cell. So calcium has to bind to troponin in order to have a muscle contraction. And without this muscle contraction can't happen without calcium, can't happen with ATP, and you can't get ATP without oxygen and glucose, which you completely understand, right? So this should look familiar. Here's the plateau with the calcium coming in. And this is pretty good because it's showing you the refractory period, absolute. So within this time in, in milliseconds right here, no matter what happens, if you get a stimulus, whatever, if somebody's silly enough to um, use like a, a amphetamine or cocaine or meth, a methamphetamine, right? It's gonna try to do, cause a, a stimulation here and can kill you if it does, but the heart is smart enough to keep this refraction going on by leveling out the ions. So that's absolute refractory. And then on the way down to repolarization, you might be able to get another action potential. You might. So relative means, okay, maybe we can get another action potential if there's another stimulus, sympathetically or not. Absolute means no way, no how. You can't get another action potential if there's stimulation during this period. And that's crucial. That is crucial. So this overlay is about the tension just the, where the muscles. So you, you need depolarization first. So know this, the electrical depolarization, ha depolarization has to happen before you actually get contraction because that's what allows the calcium to bind the troponin. And it happens, say about here, you don't have, you're not gonna have to plot this out, but the contraction of the muscle now is at its strongest because of the calcium coming in. So this is showing tension in the muscle and then it does relax, right? The muscle relaxes after repolarization diastole, right? So this is all systole right here. But first thing that happens is 
depolarization. So depole, then you have contraction. And then repolarization. And then it all starts again. You know, with heart muscle. Starting with the SA node. Remember that the SA node is only about electrical, not about muscle. The muscle is all about calcium coming in after it's been excited enough to open the calcium channels. So see how all these things work together. So repolarization, calcium has to decrease inside the cell. So it has to be transported out. Now again, the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores the calcium. Sarco that's what SR means. Let me just write that out for you. Again, this, this is kind of important in muscle and the heart muscle because this is where the calcium is sequestered. It, it, it lowers the free calcium. So anything with sarco means muscle. That's a little different in muscle when it comes to the reticulum. Because in the in other cells, this, the endoplasmic reticulum is about making um, proteins or making lipids and if it's smooth or rough, if you remember that. But in muscle, <coughs> sarcoplasmic reticulum stores and releases calcium. Yeah, so we have the sodium uh, calcium exchanger that kind of pumps, actively pumps the calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is kind of important, especially again, when it comes to using medications like digoxin, it affects this exchanger. It's like a revolving door. Sodium uh, goes out, calcium comes into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is also affected, like some drugs like digoxin also affect the sodium potassium ATPase pumps, remember those? But they're on the membrane between the ECF and the cytosol. So again, this creates, lowers the amount of calcium available for contraction, less calcium binding to troponin, less strength of muscle contraction, more or less. And sometimes you need that to decrease the demand of the heart for oxygen, for glucose, and it decreases the stress on the heart. Crazy, right? Refractory is about suppressing an action potential. So remember, absolute, no way, no how. Uh, relative, if you get a strong enough stimulus, it can happen. You can get a, an aberrant action potential and affect your heart rate, or contractility, and ultimately cardiac output. Yeah. Now, it's not saying the atria and ventricles contract at the same time. It's saying the two atria and the two ventricles contract the single units. All right? So if they do contract the single units, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. That's not going to get good cardiac filling and it's going to cause an arrhythmia and possibly cardiac arrest. And if you have cardiac arrest, you're not getting oxygen to your brain. And your brain controls everything, everything, especially breathing. And without oxygen in your blood, you're not going to last very long. Yeah. So the cardiac action potential is a little bit longer because they have that plateau with the calcium channels, the slow calcium channels coming in. So they have a little bit longer refractory periods. Again, not tetanus, it's just refractory is the electrical part, but you do get a sustained smooth contraction from that refractory period as that calcium is slowly coming in. It extends the contraction long enough. It doesn't really change the heart rate calcium, it changes the contractility. Sodium actually uh, coming in affects the heart rate. Because if sodium comes in too fast, especially at the SA node or any, any pacemaking potential cells, you're going to have increased heart rate or tachycardia, whether it's the SA node, the atrial cells, or the AV node, or ventricular cells, Purkinje cells. So here it is again. So it's good to know where this all happens. And this is, these are cardiac cells. Remember the first graph I showed you was the pacemaker cells, like the AV node, atrial cells, and, and uh, SA node, of course. So this is the cardiomyocytes, they call them. These are the ventricular cells, the working class muscles, the ones that are doing all the hard work, like pumping blood into the systemic circuit or the right ventricle, which pumps blood into the lungs. Really important. So how long have we been going here? Almost an hour. So I'm just gonna introduce this before we take a break. So this is the electrocardiogram. We'll start talking about that or EKG or ECG. Uh, you know, it used to be spelled in an old German way in British with a K, K 
electrocardiogram, but so this sticks. I like saying EKG because sometimes I get confused when I say EEG, it sounds like ECG, but know this, it's the same thing. It's all about depolarization and repolarization of the heart. That's what it's all about. Not, I mean, of course, if you get good depolarization, you're gonna have a good contraction, but please remember with an EKG, you're looking at depolarization and repolarization and that's it. And the timing, of course, and you could find that heart rate you could pretty much tell where in the heart you have a problem. <clears throat> you could also tell if you have an arrhythmia, whether the SA node is not working or the AV node is not working. And if you have ventricular, ventricular or atrial fibrillation, you can see that on the EKG. You could see heart blocks, like problems with the AV node. You can see bundle branch blocks, which if it's almost like the two sides of the heart are depolarizing at different times and it gets very erratic can lead to cardiac arrest or other problems. So it's electrical activity, which is, you know by now, it's depolarization and repolarization. So it, basically your, your body is just a big bag of ions. So you slap these electrodes, um, you know, around your sternum, chest bone and on both sides, you put most of them going to the left because the heart's more on the left. So most of your electrodes for picking up the electro, electrical activity especially on the cardiac leads are around the heart. They kind of drift down into the left fifth uh, intercostal space right around your armpit, which is called the mid axillary line. And those are the chest leads. And then you have the electrodes that go on your limbs, like your left and right arm and your left and right leg. So technically you use 10 electrodes on a, a standard EKG and the electrodes are picking up changes in the heart, believe it or not, through the electrical activity transduced to your skin. And what is it picking up? It's picking up sodium coming into the cell. So it's picking up positive membranes, a positive flow of sodium. So when sodium comes in, that changes the membrane to more positive. And that's what the electrodes pick up on the heart and on the limbs, believe it or not. Yeah. It doesn't really show you action potential, but just shows the direction, really. It's a vector, right, of depolarization. So this way, when you look at an EKG, and technically the best way to look at an EKG is 12 different views based on those electrodes, 12 different views you can look at of different parts of the heart geographically. So if you see something wrong, you can maybe say, well, maybe one of these arteries is occluded like in the apex of the heart or the left lateral wall of the heart, which is a very bad place to have an occlusion because that's the left ventricle where the myocardium is at its thickest and does most of the work to pump the oxygenated blood into the aorta. So again, it could pick up things like myocardial infarction, which is um, death of the tissue. And if you have dead tissue where you have no blood supply, like ischemia is lack of blood supply from the, you know, there's some type of decrease in oxygenated blood getting to the tissue, ischemia. Hypoxia is low oxygen in the tissue. So if you have cases of hypoxia due to ischemia, you either have injury of the tissue, the troponin, the vessels, the heart muscle itself, or you'll have death, which is called infarction. So death of muscle, muscle tissue in the heart is called myocardial infarction and colloquially, that's called a heart attack, the term for myocardial infarction. So heart attack is, a, is not what you should be using. You should say myocardial infarction. Ischemia is just lack of blood supply, which is a problem and can lead to myocardial infarction. And you could have symptoms and you could see ischemia on a, an ECG, EKG. You could see high levels of potassium in your blood on an EKG. You can see arrhythmias, of course, like atrial fibrillation, um, heart block, um, AV blocks, bundle branch blocks, and a couple of other things that you can see from just looking at or, or congenital problems, possibly something you're, you're born with that throws off your electrical system. And what you, and what you want to see is normal sinus rhythm. You want to see just like this, like baseline, nice, sexy wave there a little bit of a delay, a little blip downward, upward, downward, and then another hill after, and that's your heartbeat. 
So you have three waves mainly, or three, I mean, one's a complex. You have a P wave, then this whole thing together is called QRS. So this is Q, R, and S complex. And this is called a T wave. And I'll tell you what they are. We'll come back and talk about it. So it's not recording systole and diastole, but it's happening, what's happening electrically. So P is atrial depolarization, when the atrials depolarize. Then you have a little delay between P and the Q, or P and the R really, and that's called your PR interval. So the PR interval is a delay that's caused by the AV node slowing down the action potentials that started in the SA node. So if you, you need to see a nice sexy P wave in order to call it sinus rhythm. And if you have a nice normal QRS like this one, and the heart rate is within 60 to 100, you have yourself sinus rhythm. So in order to call it sinus rhythm, you have to have a nice sexy P wave. Because if it's ugly like this, that's a problem, right? Or if it's, or if it's upside down, that's a problem, right? Or, or if there's no P wave, that's a problem. Okay, so in order to call it sinus rhythm, you have to have a P wave. So the QRS complex is ventricular depolarization. Of course, that's way bigger than the P, which is atrial depolarization, because the ventricles are massive compared to the atria. You've seen the heart. I don't know if you did a dissection, but it's, it, you can only hardly see the atria compared to the ventricles. Then the T wave is your ventricular repolarization. You want a nice round, it's a little bit bigger than the P wave, T wave. And then it all starts again with another P wave and QRS complex and then T wave and again. Okay, so you can, you can get the heart rate by counting the RR interval, right, between the two Rs. Because the EKG paper comes out at about 25 um, millimeters per second. And there's a formula you can use for calculating your heart rate based on the distance number of little boxes, which are one millimeter each. Point, uh, 0 0.04 seconds. But there's other ways to mention heart, to find heart rate. Probably the easiest way to get the heart rate by just look at the EKG paper. It tells you what the heart rate is. But of course, if you're going to be going to PA or in nursing school, you have to learn how to calculate heart rate based on the RR interval or the there's a memorization technique where you use your 300, 150, 100 with the boxes. And then sometimes they just use a six second strip and you just count the R waves and just multiply by 10. So again, I don't know if we're doing that in here. So here it is, here's your definitions. You'll know this again, the test will be straightforward. Like as always, you'll just have to know, okay, that's atrial depolarization. And there's a PQ interval right, between the P wave and the Q. It's called atrial systole, but the PR interval, which I mentioned is about the AV node. So it's not telling you what's happening except for a delay. So the PQ interval is the atrial systole. And the QRS is ventricular depolarization. So you know this is happening, even though, again, the EKG is only showing you electrical activity. And then there's an ST segment, which makes sense because that's where the ventricular systole takes place. So this has to be it's homeostatic, has to have the right number, right? And at rest, of course. And the T wave represents and denotes ventricular repolarization. So here it is, and all the intervals. So yeah, you should be able to pick these out. See like the PR interval wasn't mentioned on the last page, but this is the delay due to the AV node. That's important. That's really important actually, because if this gets too short, you're in trouble. Not, not horrible, but you're in trouble. You, it means that um, the sinus rhythm is not giving normal sinus rhythm. It's gonna give more of a AV rhythm, which you really don't want. So this has to be completely correct. And I believe it's 0 0.12 to two seconds. So if it's too low, you may have a problem. And if it's too long, you may have a block in the AV node. So here's more segments. Again, I don't like talking about systole too much here, but it does make sense what they told you on the page before. It's like, the, like this atrial systole and then ventricular systole. It's kind of cool because it helps you understand at this point what's going on with the anatomy of the heart, what's going on electrically, and what's going on with 
pressures with that Wigger's diagram that freaked me out. And then with the ejection, which all happens after, right? After this happens. So in some cases, that diagram that I showed you at the beginning, you'd have to kind of overlay the EKG on top of that. But we're not gonna have to do that. And don't and remember, this is the action potential chart or graph of the myocardial cells, the working cells of the ventricles with the plateau. Remember that like sustained slow cal calcium influx channels, voltage gated calcium channels that are slow. Okay. And this is just showing you, this is really good because it shows you, you know, how it starts, right? It starts in the SA node. So you start to get that little bit, the P wave begins. And then it goes to the atrial cells with Bachman's bundles to the AV node. Then by the time that's all done, you have a nice sexy P wave. Right now, <clears throat> as this is depolarizing, the, the valves are opened. So you're getting ventricular filling and you can have atrial systole. And then it starts, the ventricles will start to depolarize after a delay, right? After that PR interval. <clears throat> so now here's ventricular depolarization, QRS. So all this is lighting up between the bundle of his, the left and right bundle branches and all the Purkinje fibers. So you have a nice ventricular depolarization. And then of course the ventricles have to repolarize and that's your T wave. And it all starts again. The only thing you don't see here, and this is kind of important, you don't see atrial repolarization because atrial repolarization happens during this. So atrial repolarization gets lost in the QRS complex. So you do have that, but you really want that atrial depolarization, the P wave. That's really important. So I'll go through the EKG when we come back from a break, because you probably need a break right now, I would imagine. If I could figure out how to stop sharing. Did we stop sharing? Everybody okay? Any questions about any of this? So this is the physical part of the EKG. Again, if you're remote, you'll never get to do this, but just to talk about the leads. Now, in a standard EKG, there's 12 leads, but there's really only 10 electrodes in standard. Let's see what the book has to say. So the electrodes go over the heart. You have the cardiac leads, which are six, six precordial or heart leads. Or I should say electrodes, sorry, electrodes. And you have four limb electrodes for 12 leads. So the four limbs and the six around the heart and more to the left. So there's three basic uh, bipolar leads they're called and these are about the limbs, lead one, two, and three. And basically forms a triangle from your right arm to your left arm and then down to your left leg. Because the right leg really is just a ground Right? They put an electrode there, but it really doesn't record anything. It just keeps the depolarization flowing the right direction. So like lead one goes from right arm to left arm and the positive is always where the arrow is pointing. Lead two goes this way, positive down here. So lead two, if you remember this, is the best lead to use to see the QRS complex because the lead when this is superimposed will show the left lateral lower part of the heart. Lead three goes down this way. So it forms like this nice triangle and they kind of meet in the middle at the AV node actually. One, three, and two. So positive is all here, left side, right? So if the heart was overlaid here, this would be more left side of the heart. And then they augment the leads. The machine does this to these leads called AVR, AVL, and AVF. So it's six leads because they augment. That's what A stands for, augmented voltage of the right arm, augmented voltage of the left arm, and augmented voltage of the foot, which is only the left foot. You notice that the electrodes are only put on the leg, left leg. 
right? So lead one is between the right arm and the left arm. This is wrong. Left arm. Sorry about that. It happens with the publisher sometimes. So lead one goes from the left, the right arm to the left arm, not the right leg. There is no right leg. It's, all, it's an electrode, but not a lead because the lead are the vectors. The leads are the vectors and you should write that direction of the impulse or the depolarization. So a vector has, um, it's measurable with direction and amplitude, like how much, how high, how much depolarization. So sorry, your book was wrong about that lead one. And then you have these three augmented leads. So you get a nice view of the frontal part of the heart, right? Like if you could see all the different parts of the front of the heart, like here's the top atria and the ventricles. So, and the heart kind of goes off to the left. I might've told you that in the recording. So the vectors like the right arm, the left arm lead one and then lead AVF goes straight down. AVR goes away from the left ventricle. AVL comes up this way and then lead three down here and lead two right over here, which is the left wall of the heart. And that's what's the thickest because the mo more thick the myocardium is, the more thickness of the cells, the greater the depolarizations. So in lead two, you can have a nice upright QRS like I drew before in lead two. So that's the best frontal lead to look at for sure. But an AV, AVR is showing the right atrium. So we're going to see something like this. You're going to see P and then you're going to see an upside down wave because this is lead two. And this is the best lead to look at because that's where you get that nice picture. You'll see a nice EKG readout of your P, Q, R, S, and T. Lead two. And, and lead uh, one isn't so bad either. So the further you, those vectors go away from the left wall, the, um, the less amplitude of the QRS complex. Because again, remember we're talking about, we really want ventricular output here, ventricular depolarization. And the six chest leads now look in the horizontal plane, like looking down at the heart. So it's hard to draw that, but they're, they're named V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. So the ones that go through the left lateral wall mostly are these. So these all should have positive upright QRSs where these don't, they're negative because you're looking more right side of the heart away from the thickness of the left ventricle and more right lateral. So this is, again, there's, there's different ways to, to see like if you have problems in any of these different leads, you could see the difference. So the leads all together are, lead, are the frontal leads one, two, three, and it should be a little a, AVR, AVL, and AVF. And those are your six frontal leads that you see like a clock, looking at a clock. And these are your six precordial or your chest leads or horizontal leads, transverse leads. So the best lead to look at in the chest leads or precordial leads, I would say V5 is the best one, the most upright. So lead two, sorry, that's three. Lead two and lead V5 are the two best leads to look at in the 12 lead EKG and standard placement. But sometimes you don't put the, the leads or the electrodes, I should say. You don't put the electrodes on the actual limbs. Like if you're doing a stress test, you do what's called a modified uh, electrode placement and you put them on the upper chest for your arms and you put them down on your iliac region like right above your groin for the limb leads so you don't trip over the wires right so you can still get a readout of those leads based on where the electrodes are put so another difference between the electrodes in the uh, um, leads so here is this triangle they call this Einthoven's triangle and this is with lead one, two, and three. 
So again, you have an electrode on the right arm. This is where you put it, medial wrist, left arm, and left leg. You do put an electrode on the, the right leg, but again, that's only for a ground. In fact, it's green, always green, so you know green for ground. So lead one comes straight across, and that would be the positive electrode there. Lead two comes down this way, so this is lead two, the negative, and then the positive here, so lead two goes this way, and lead three comes down this way. So they're all going to ultimately meet in the middle at the AV node and look at just the heart because it's they're just showing the extrapolation of everything. And then you have the in between the augmented leads or in between those three leads and those are unipolar leads. This is the chest electrode placement. And you can see you go down to about the fourth, one, two, three, fourth intercostal space and you put it on both sides, um, V1, V2. V3 is in the fifth intercostal space. V4 and V5 and V6 kind of go along to the mid axillary line, which is here. So that's placement of the electrodes. Remember, there's only 10 electrodes, and it, but there's 12 leads. So the right leg is a ground. The electrode is a ground for the right leg. And you add the augmented, three augmented leads to the frontal plane. So this is the transverse plane or horizontal plane cross section. And this one, the limb leads are the frontal plane, like a clock. So you can see anterior posterior with this one more. And this one you can see right left and lateral or inferior. And also you can see anterior and posterior with this one too. So he's looking at 12 different views of the heart via the EKG readout, which should be 12 lead EKG. So this is talking about <coughs> electrode uh, placement, electrode placement, although it's saying leads because these are the leads. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And these are where the electrodes go or with, with the direction of the leads anyway. There you have it. So they're showing where the electrodes go. Notice the one again, left arm, right? Not, not right leg, like I said before. Heart sounds, now we do auscultation. Auscultation is using a stethoscope. And there's different areas where you can listen to the beats best. And then also you can listen for murmurs and murmurs are sounds, like a murmur is a sound that you hear with auscultation. That's a sound of turbulence, which I might've mentioned on the last, um, the end of last recording. Like if you're, um, standing by a stream and there's like a lot of rocks in the stream, you hear more sounds as the, as the water hits the, the rocks. Sorry, that's probably an A, who knows. So lub, you should, this is easy, you probably know this by now, is closure of the AV valves after depolarization of the ventricles. So remember, depolarization happens first, that's why it doesn't happen at the same time. So this is also called, really it's not called lub, it's called S1 first sound, and dub is S2, second sound. So I like the saying though, you know, where you hear that at the beginning of the T wave, like when it all starts again with depolarization, remember the T wave is, deep, is repolarization of the ventricle, so that's electrical. The dub is actually closing of the semilunar outflow valves, pulmonic and aortic. So you listen for that. And here's back to the Wiggers diagram, excellent. I was hoping it would be uh, put in here somewhere. So again, what's on the y-axis is the pressures, right? And we're talking about ventricular pressures here in blue. So of course that goes up as it's filling, right? You see it going up all the way here to 120, that's pretty high, but it has to reach about 90 to open up the uh, SL valves. 
So of course it's increasing. So right, this is where it's matching up now to the beginning of the R wave here, where it starts to go up. And here's the sound. When the AV valves close, and then here, the semilunar valves can open, right? That's S. I'm sorry, these semilunar valves can open right about here. It doesn't really show you that yet. So that would be after contraction and ejection. And it's showing you the match up, and this looks correct. And then interventricular pressure falls after ejection. So ejection is right about here. So the semilunar valves open, then you have ejection. And of course, this is pressure, and the pressure decreases when it starts to fill again. So again, this is a pretty good matchup. This is pr pretty well done here. Now, arrhythmias, that's what this says up here, arrhythmias are really problems with that conduction system and the ion channels. So usually if it's a problem with a certain ion coming in too fast or, or not coming in enough, it can cause an arrhythmia. So this is away from normal sinus rhythm. So normal sinus rhythm is again, the P, sexy P, delay, Q, R, S, and then T. So you could have no P wave, could cause an arrhythmia. You could have severe tachycardia where the R waves come up too quick. You could have no, delay, you got an upside down P wave that could show you certain arrhythmias. Showing you on the EKG that there's problems with those pacemaker cells like the AV node or the SA node or the atrial cells or the ventricles. But usually the ventricles are the last resort. So that we really need a good sinus rhythm and we need a delay and we need good, of course, bundle branch propagation. So it's abnormal and it shows up on the EKG and abnormalities within, like this is one beat. So you could see, but in order to see an arrhythmia, you can't just look at one beat. You should look at at least 30 seconds or at least, at least five consecutive beats within an EKG. So arrhythmias, again, are caused by those channel problems, calcium channels, sodium channels are too sensitive, maybe too jumpy, too, too quick with the sodium. The, the resting membrane potential goes from minus 85 and then they go a little bit more positive which you don't want that to happen like you can go to minus 70 which is not appropriate for a heart muscle appropriate for the neuron but not the heart muscle depolarization resting membrane potential so the drugs that are given are, are given to change those those channels basically and there's group, four groups and these are kind of interesting so i, I think these are important i think we're going to learn these so uh, group one drugs are sodium channel blockers, basically slowing down the depolarization, like quinidine, quinine, procainamide, and, and lidocaine. Lidocaine is a classic anesthetic, right? Because it, it stop, blocks sodium channels. So if you, if you put that on your skin, you're not gonna de depolarize the pain receptors. So this could work in the heart. So usually before they do anything with the heart, if you're a cardiac, arrest, the first thing they do is blast you with an injection of lidocaine. Group two are your beta blockers that block the receptors for epinephrine. So, and really when you block a, a channel for epinephrine, and you know what the beta block or the beta adrenergic receptors are like, then epinephrine can cause influx of calcium. So you have slower heart rate, you slow down the heart rate by blocking epinephrine. So beta, it, beta receptors are your beta one adrenergic receptors on the heart. So it blocks the binding of epinephrine. And this, if you look in your grandma's medicine cabinet, you'll see this all, all over the place, this propanerol, atenolol, or usually given when you have high blood pressure really, this will lower your blood pressure and decrease your heart contraction rate, or decrease your heart rate. Very common given beta blockers, right? The other ones are channel blockers for potassium. Potassium, again, it slows down. It prolongs repolarization, what it does. It stops potassium from leaving the cell. Yeah. So it elongates the, the repolarization. Amiodarone. 
your bone. And this is a popular one here, the, the calcium channel blockers. So it blocks calcium. And then what this does is um, decreases the demand by decreasing the strength of contraction. Verapamil is a classic one there in calcium. But digoxin works a little differently. It affects the calcium influx, but it really works on the sodium potassium um, ATPase, which stops the sodium calcium exchanger, which keeps low levels of calcium in the, in the actual cytoplasm of the cell. So verapamil is just a, a calcium channel blocker. So that's really what I like to know, like calcium blockers, potassium channel blockers, and beta blockers and sodium blockers. That's a pretty, pretty tough thing. But of course, you know, you know, maybe for the study questions, I'll have some of the drug names that be on there. So maybe I, I always remember like verapamil, tenolol, lidocaine are pretty easy to remember. This one's a little tougher, but there are other ones, right? But this is the mechanism of action. And that's really what you, the, the takeaway here. You know, you have, if you have a pathology where you're getting tachycardia or you have an arrhythmia, of course, what we're talking about arrhythmia is problems with the conduction system. It's going to show up on the EKG. And these drugs have mechanisms of actions and they're blocking channels. And that's the mechanism of action to block the pathophysiology of the condition, of the heart condition. And, and you know that these heart conditions are very widespread. Okay, any questions on the cardiac cycle? Everybody okay? Anything? Let me take a look at you guys, are you awake? Yeah, you guys are all awake. I see hands up, thumbs up. Yeah, so again, did that kind of fast, but that's the way this class is set up. We're gonna tell you, you gotta go slow sometimes and you're gonna speed up. So yeah, the heart was interesting. Um, and really though, you know, without the nervous system receiving that oxygen from this transport system, which starts with the pumping heart, right? The pumping heart, the heart pumps, it contracts and pumps blood out into the systemic circuit, into the coronary circuit and the pulmonary circuit. So I kind of made a big deal on that, I'm sure somewhere in that recording, the difference between the three circuits, what the systemic circuit is, what the pulmonary circuit is and what the coronary circuit is. That's really important. Because now we're gonna talk about vessels, which are kind of the roadways that take these nutrients, hormones and oxygenated blood, of course, to, the, um, to every cell in the body, really. So let's look at blood vessels. And this is where it starts. So let's, let's define some of these things. And I might've mentioned some of these are ready, like the definition of an artery today, which I'm sure I did. So of course, an, an artery takes blood away from the heart. So then the systemic circuit, the arteries are red. They're, they glow red because of the chemical binding oxygen. So they're oxygenated. But in the pulmonary circuit, the arteries are blue. They're deoxygenated blood or less oxygenated blood. So the arteries start with the aorta, right? That's the largest artery in the body. Now this is like, this is a main vessel. This is like, you know, Route 95, delivering everything. And then it'll branch to distributing arteries, like the renal artery to the kidneys, the carotid artery to the head, the um, femoral artery, the brachial artery, all the ones that feed. And they're more muscular arteries. So I guess we'll call them distributing arteries. They're muscular too. Their walls have high amounts of smooth muscle. And then that'll branch into these smaller, cute little arterioles. So the aorta is like Route 95 and distributing arteries are like maybe Route 87. Then you get on like the, you know, the um, Harlem River Drive, right? And then as you make a turn, you get off and go down Park Avenue, still distributing, but then you get into like the streets, like the 71st Street, and you're more into arterioles, right? And that's where, and, this, and again, this is systemic now. So all of this is systemic, always systemic. There's always oxygenated blood from the aorta out. And then once you get to the school, you have exchange, right? You meet your friends, you walk inside, you have people coming in, people coming out. 
So this capillaries are an area of exchange. So exchanging things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, right? CO2 and also fluids and other electrolytes and your glucose and your amino acids and fatty acids, all those things are exchanged in the capillaries. So the aorta is very elastic because it works under high pressure, right? Things in that big left ventricle, Jimi Hendrix pumping against it. Distributing arteries are a little more muscular so they can have a muscle, they can have a tone, a vasomotor tone to distribute the blood under high pressure. High pressure, you need high pressure to get the blood to these arterioles Arterioles are like have like constrictor muscles, like sphincters that kind of act as valves to allow blood to flow into the tissue where the capillaries are, the capillary the tissue capillaries, the lung capillaries, which are called pulmonary capillaries. And you have certain specialized capillaries in the kidney. So we're talking about the tissue and the exchange of nutrients and gases in the capillaries. So oxygen should be coming into the tissue, right? CO2 is out, that comes out. And that's what goes into these, the other end of the capillary is the venues. So now we have in the systemic circuit, the venues start your deoxygenated veins, systemic veins. So the cute little venues come out of the capillary. It's just like the arterioles came in under high pressure, the venules leave a very low pressure. So everything slows down in this little area here of capillary. So you can get an exchange because then things are pumping into the aorta, it's massive turbulence, distributing arteries, arterioles, but the capillaries things slow down, relax, let the blood flow into the tissue, into the cells. And then what comes out is lower pressure is the venules. And the venules will branch further into the veins and usually have companion veins for the arteries, especially the distributing arteries. These aren't called distributing, though. now we're draining back, right? Veins. Definition of a vein is a vessel that takes blood back to the heart. There's really only one place, and that's the right atrium. So I can just say that right atrium is the next place. That's the next stop of Grand Central, off Grand Central. So I talked about how the right side is more deoxygenated blood, and the right atrium is where you have your venous return. Right? I talked about venous return before when I talked about end diastolic volume that you need to get the proper amount of blood into the atria to have those pressures increase to open up those valves and fill the ventricles. So these are all the roadways outside the heart. Whoa, what's going on here? So this is showing you a bit of the histology and this is important, right? This is a, a important. And they're only showing you systemic um, vessels here. Let's always start, I was like, let's start with the veins, why not? So you have large vein, a medium sized vein, and then you have the venule and then the capillaries. I was showing you two different types of capillaries and I'll point to that. Okay, so let's, this is what you need to know. Let's look at the histology, the difference between an artery and a vein, especially the large arteries and the large veins. First of all, you should notice that in the veins, all of them, the lumens are bigger than the arteries. See that? And they all have the same layers, right? So just lining the lumen is what's called endothelium. So it's a, a thin layer of simple squamous epithelium. It's important to line things. So endothelium lines both, and they're kind of the same. There's no valves in the large veins. You only see valves in the smaller or medium-sized ones, like below your, your groin, actually. Then there's this one, and, and this, this, this is one thing that's really different. The tunica media of both of these is smooth muscle. Remember, media muscle, smooth muscle, of course, involuntary. So this is what, now you're introduced to smooth muscle, which is completely operated by sympathetic impulses. And it has its own vasomotor tone. So tunica intima or interna is the endothelium. Endothelium, they both have that in large vessels. Tunica externa is like anchoring connective tissue for both. So it anchors it to things like muscles or bone or adipose. All right? Now, one thing that's important in the large artery, like the aorta, is its elasticity. So they all have, believe it or not, it doesn't tell you here, but they all have a, an elastic membrane, internal and external, actually. 
But in the aorta, which is the large artery, let's face it, aorta is the the large artery because it goes all the way down to behind your belly button around L5. And but the aorta is very elastic because it works under pressure because that's the first artery after the left ventricle, right? So the medium-sized arteries are the distributing arteries. These are the roadways that take blood to general areas of your body, like the, the leg, like the inside leg, the outside leg, the kidney, and the veins return blood from those organs or tissue back to the heart. So they have all the parts except some medium-sized veins have valves, but everything else is the same. They have tunica externa, they have tunica media, but notice that the tunica media in the medium-sized arteries is thicker because these are operating under high pressure from the left ventricle and their own vasomotor tone from the smooth muscle contraction. Whereas venous is low pressure. Thank God they have valves. And that's why there's valves in these vessels because you have to keep that blood moving anterograde, which is upward back to the heart. You know, you're not always standing up, but you do have to deal with gravity at times. Now here's the cute little venules and the arterioles, which are basically just the endothelium with no tunica media, no tunica media. So there's no smooth muscle within the walls, but it has these valves or sphincters, which are circular cuff-like muscles that control how much blood goes in and out of the capillaries or in the capillaries, and this is more out of the capillaries. So it has tunic externa, again, no tunic media. Always has endothelium. Every vessel has endothelium, and the heart has endothelium as well. And of course, the venules have valves to keep that blood flowing in that direction under very low pressure. So this is showing you two different things, like fenestrated and continuous capillary. But let me just see if this says anything down here. But the capillary, a capillary, all a capillary is is endothelium with a piece of connective tissue called a basement membrane. So capillaries are small, just big enough to house a, a, like a five micrometer red blood cell. But they, they have pores in them, like there's pores between the cells. So they, they're leaky, right? So most of your systemic capillaries are called continuous. They are porous, but they're controlled porous. Fenestrated means opening, like fenestrated is window-like, there's bigger openings. And you really only see these in like uh, end uh, um, endocrine glands, or you can see these in the kidney, like the kidney capillaries, the glomerulus is fenestrated. So I can't say that these, you know, your systemic capillaries are continuous capillaries. This is a typical, most common, Capillaries continuous. It's porous, but not as porous as a fenestrated. Fenestrated means openings like windows. And sinuses, like they have sinusoid capillaries too. That's in the liver. Sinusoid capillaries are almost are huge holes, like big percolating blood coming in and out of them in the liver where things are being detoxified and manufactured. So that's more in the liver where fenestrated is more in the kidney where you're filtering blood. But your systemic capillary is feeding the brain tissue, feeding all the tissue, your muscles, your epithelial tissue, all of that connective tissue in your body is continuous capillary. So that's a good takeaway. This is a really good slide showing the differences between an artery and a vein. So arteries have no valves under, uh, they operate under high pressure because they have the tunica medias that's muscle. It adds to the pressure. That's why the left ventricle has to fight against that arterial pressure, especially the pressure in the aorta. So you want to keep your blood pressure down so your left ventricle doesn't have to work so hard. Because if it does, you're going to have problems with left ventricular hypertrophy, which could happen in a normal um, athlete, a, a severe athlete, or you know, a um, Ironman, a marathon runner. And that's physiological hypertrophy. But sometimes the heart working against inordinate pressure have pathological hypertrophy. And that can happen on the right ventricle too, if you have problems with pressure in your lungs. 
So the pressures are important in the vessels now. Now we're out of the heart. So here's the tunics, which really means layer. Internal is always called endothelium. And it's a very thin layer of epithelial cells. And every epithelial tissue has, is lined at the bottom by a, a basement membrane. And this is where you see that elastic lamina within that tunic very external, especially the internal elastic lamina. So the type of epithelium is always simple squamous, flat cells. One layer means simple, squamous means flat, like a paver stone. So it's simple, simple squamous epithelium is called endo because it's inside. Tunica media, I think, is the most important. This is the one you should pay most attention to because that's talking about smooth muscle. And remember, the arteries have a lot more than veins. And that's why there's more pressure. And they have a bigger job, too, because they have to deliver the oxygen in the blood under that pressure to all the tissues in the body, especially the brain. And externa is CT, connective tissue. It's like an anchoring tissue. To your muscles, to your bones, to your other connective tissue like adipose. Yeah. So the elastic arteries are the one closer to the heart, like, of course, the aorta, which is the largest artery in the body. Closer to the heart, not metaphorically, geographically. And of course, they stretch more because they're working under pressure, right? And they recoil. That's why you got that little dichrotic notch on that Wheeler's diagram, a crazy diagram that we looked at a couple of times. Because it's like the aorta exerts a pressure on the valve from the opposite direction. But as long as that aortic valve, that semilunar outflow valve is good, you have no problems, completely normal. The muscular arteries, these are again, the ones that are distributing. So they're further away from the heart. And of course they have a smaller lamina, so there's more resistance. And resistance is, it's hard to describe, but usually resistance comes from narrowing a lumen. Like if you narrow a lumen, like if you press on a, a hose, right? And sometimes the water comes out faster because you're increasing the resistance by decreasing the radius of the lumen. And that increases blood pressure actually. So the smooth muscle in these muscular arteries have to do with systemic blood pressure too. Like when you put that blood pressure cuff on your arm, the doctor's office, the spigmo manometer, they're actually measuring the pressure of your brachial artery, which is a muscular artery between, your, well, it's in your upper arm, the branches below your elbow. So you're testing the pressure there. So it's about how much resistance. And that should be homeostatic, how much resistance. And there's other, uh, besides radius, the radius of the, of the vessel or diameter is, is really the most important um, cause of resistance, or the biggest factor in resistance, which affects your blood pressure, systemic blood pressure throughout your whole body. So arterioles are smaller, of course, than the muscular arteries. And of course they have those sphincters, so they have resistance as well. So the sphincters control the lumen as well and how much blood flow and the speed of blood flow into the tissue. So now we're getting right next to the capillary, right? And the capillaries where the exchange happens. So things have to slow down before they get into the capillaries. And sometimes they speed up, which is a problem with absorption of certain things in the, or exchange of certain things within the tissue beds, as they're called. So we could talk about a few things like these are pathologies now. So this is really interesting. Now, like an aneurysm is a dilation of a vessel. It looks like it's ballooning. You know, like you, you have if the vessel is here, this is the way it's supposed to be the diameter. All of a sudden, blood starts pooling and it kind of dilates. This is abnormal. So you have endothelium, you have all that, but it's dilating. So blood's kind of pooling into the layers. And that the, the walls become very thin, very, uh, you know, it affects cardiac output, of course, it affects blood flow. Depends where it is, too. If you have this in your brain, you're, you're, at risk for a stroke or hemorrhage. But in the aorta, now that's a, a big vessel, big elastic vessel, that's very common to have aneurysms there. In fact, you could have one, and this happens in older people, so I don't wanna scare you, but aortic aneurysms are usually found coincidentally. You know, they, they, you don't know you have them. And if you had high blood pressure to that, they become almost dangerous. It depends on where they are, whether they're right above the heart, 
or down in the mid back or in the abdominal area, the abdominal aorta is below the diaphragm. And that's branching to the, the renal arteries and the, to the legs. But it also can occur in the brain, the cerebral arteries, or anywhere really, even in the legs or arms. You can have aneurysms, but most commonly in the aorta. So a tearing or dissection of a aneurysm or dissecting aneurysms, a tear in the wall, actual where it tears. And this is a problem. Now, this is an emergency, a dissection of an, of an aneurysm or of an aorta. And that happens again if it's the top of the aorta, right off the left ventricle, the ascending aorta, then it's operating under a lot of pressure and the blood is just not going to get through to the rest of the body. And that's a, a, an emergency that needs to be surgically repaired ASAP. All right. So aneurysms that can be caused for bad luck, really congenital causes, right? Or if you have problems with cardiovascular disease, like placking of the arteries, which is called atherosclerosis, we have fatty plaques within the tunica intima and into the tunica media, it builds up clotting factors. And it's a mess and it occludes the arteries and causes a lot of inflammation, which is really puts you at risk for heart disease. And also having high blood pressure. I think, honestly, I think hypertension is one of the biggest causes of aneurysm and dissection of an aorta. Because you could have both. You could have a congenital weakness in the tissue of the aorta and, that, and you add hypertension to that, then you're definitely at risk for a dissection. And if you add more to that, like atherosclerosis or tachycardia, then you're adding even more. Oh, and if you do something silly like smoking a lot, then you're at risk again. So there's a lot of risks for aneurysms, but most of it is bad luck in general. Yeah. This looks normal again. So microcirculation, I like microcirculation. So here's the blood coming from the arteries, right? What was the artery again? That was like the um, Holland River Drive and um, FDR. And then you have the arterioles, which are kind of branch from the arteries coming into the capillary beds. So the arterioles have these pre-capillary sphincters that control blood flow, speed and volume. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes you have these mid-arterial shunts. It depends on where the tissue is, right, to the venous system. But you want exchange in most of your tissue, oxygen into the tissue, carbon dioxide out. So the red blood is all oxygenated blood coming into the capillaries. See, capillaries are purple because they are both oxygenated and deoxygenated as they're exchanging the gases. And then the venule part will receive the blood from the capillaries and will continue into the veins, to the right atrium, systemic veins. So remember the histology, right? The arteries have smaller lumens than the veins. The veins have valves, arteries do not. The arteries have thicker tunica medias. And notice there's no pre-capillary or post-capillary sphincters on the venules too. So that pretty much go, comes out of very low pressure and it has a lot to do with osmosis, believe it or not, how much fluid is in, reabsorbed back into the uh, vessels and the vein, venules. There's also vessels that are not here called lymph. Now this is different, now lymph, they usually do that in yellow. Sorry that I'm running in red, I'm in the slideshow here. So. Lymph will reabsorb excess fluid in the tissues. So whatever fluid is not brought back into the veins on the, on the end of the capillary will go into the lymph system. So lymph's a good drainage of these capillary beds, which is all this here. And this is how things are brought in and brought out. It goes back to that pump in the middle of your chest that we call the heart. Capillaries are probably the most interesting. Again, they're the smallest, just big enough to fit like a blood, red blood cell. And all they are is simple squamous endothelium and a basement membrane. Yeah, and this is where you have your exchanges between, in the, of course, in the tissue beds, you're exchanging the gases and nutrients between blood and tissue. In the lungs, you're, you're exchanging between the lungs and blood. So this is in the tissue now, not the lungs. Yeah, so you have vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And this has everything to do with blood flow and radius 
right? Now, the vasoconstriction and vasodilation does not happen in the capillary. Please, this is kind of misleading because capillaries have no muscular wall. The arteries have muscular walls, sort of the veins, but the arteries are more uh, usable. So constriction will narrow the lumen, vasodilation will open up the lumen. So vasoconstriction may decrease blood flow, but it increases blood pressure. Vasodilation does the opposite. Vasodilation decreases your blood pressure, by right? slowing down basically what's going on. Think of the garden hose, I guess. And the pre-capillary sphincters are on your arterioles. So they're more like valves, letting in and slowing down blood flow uh, or speed of blood flow, first of all, and then decreasing the amount of blood that's going to a tissue bed or a capillary bed within the tissue is a better way to say it. Yeah. So the continuous capillaries, like I said, are the most common. And they're kind of close together. They have junctions. And again, you found you see them in muscles, of course, because you need blood flow. Obviously, you need blood flow into muscles. That's a huge thing. Blood flow into the muscles and of course the sphincters and all that. But they're, they're talking about the blood-brain barrier. Now I'm not that comfortable putting that here because the blood-brain barrier the astrocytes and the endothelial cells of the brain vessels are very tight junctions. So they're more specialized continuous capillary. They're tight junctions between those simple squamous cells. Where continuous capillaries are pretty much everywhere in your tissue beds are, they're pores, make no mistake. They're pores for, for exchange. Now the fenestrated ones are more like in the kidneys for your filtration. Right, or absorption in the intestines, those blood vessels or endocrine glands to secrete hormones into the ECF to the blood. Discontinuous, big gaps, and I like to call these sinusoids. So they're discontinuous because they have large gaps, large gaps, not just gaps, large gaps. They all have gaps, except for the blood brain barrier. That's not, they have very, very tight junctions. Yeah, so in the spongy bone of your bone marrow where you're making blood cells where things are making, the liver is a great example of a discontinuous or sinusoid. Spleen too, spleen too, when you're making white blood cells and storing white blood cells and making platelets. And that's part of the place, one of the places where red blood cells go to die and be sold off for their parts. So of course, this is one place where like in the liver where proteins could get through the capillaries. That can't happen anywhere else. Proteins stay in the vessel, except for in the liver, where they're going to be put back into the blood anyway through regular capillaries, veins. Yeah. So here's the capillary. I think that's what this is showing us here, capillaries. So a little difference in the two. I don't think this is that important. Just to talk about the, the intercellular channel is about it and the fenestration. So visceral, like your endocrine glands or your um, kidney and your muscle capillaries in most of your tissue beds, especially the muscle, which is tissue, right? It's a type of tissue that needs blood supply and oxygen, of course. This is important because the, the veins is where most of your blood is at one time. Because again, it's, it's like a reservoir of blood. I think it's like 60, 62 or 65% of all the blood in your body at one time is in the systemic veins, systemic veins, not pulmonary. Right, so veins again, low pressure. But if, if you go into exercise or sympathetic stimulation, remember that the veins have tunica medias as well. So we can recruit that blood to, to increase your cardiac output and increase your venous return by exercise, of course. Yeah, so here's some of the things about thinner walls in the, in the veins than arteries, very low pressure, almost zero, really. Coming into the vena cavas, into the right atrium, it's, it's could be less than two. So they have large lumens and they're more collapsible. And that makes sense, right? They're more collapsible where they're more likely to kind of shrivel a little bit and respond to something like that, like a needle, right? The people with weak veins are gonna collapse and that does not happen in an artery because those tunica medias are so important. Again, veins return blood to the heart. They don't help. That's what they do. 
It's exactly what they do in all circuits. Right? So you need a skeletal muscle pump for venous, venous return. I mentioned that before. Helps pump the blood anterograde in the right direction towards the right ventricle. Not every vein has a valve. Like the vena cavas don't have valves. Just the, <clears throat> the peripheral veins and pretty much up to the bottom of the vena cavas, or the, the bottom of the inferior vena cava anyway, because of course, inferior vena cava is coming from the bottom of the body, or superior vena cava is from the top. So it has a little help with gravity. Whereas the lower peripheral veins are working against gravity. And breathing, like I'm talking, uh, I talked about before, the movement of the diaphragm and changes the intra-thoracic pressure in kind of causing like a vacuum of blood going from the vena cavas into the right atrium. Oh, this is cool. This is like, a, let's say a calf muscle. Like you have a gastroc, of course, not drawn perfectly, but this contraction of your muscles actually creates a pump. So blood can move in one direction. If it backflows, the valve will keep it from becoming static in the ankle, say. This could be a quadricep too. Right, so it keeps blood moving in the anterograde forward direction, not retrograde, which is opposite. So varicose veins are just engorged peripheral veins or superficial veins, I should say. Like var varicose veins, you can see because they're very, they're, they're on the surface, right? They're not deep veins. So the problem with varicose or, or superficial veins is they don't have the skeletal muscle pump. They're not anchored deep inside a muscle. They're on the outside, just under the skin. So they have a propensity to get more engorged and kind of worm-like, and sometimes very large. And um, they look kind of kind of unsightly, like spiders, not spider veins, but thick, full veins that are visible from the outside. So genetic plays a role in that. People who are standing all the time and have stasis in their legs, it's just uh, occupational, right? People with very long arteries, because the, the bigger you are, the higher your BMI, the longer your blood vessels are. So it's, it's harder to get blood back, let alone get blood in. Pregnancy, of course, age is always something, but we should change that. Pregnancy, of course, because the inordinate pressures and the change in the uterus that compresses the abdominal veins. So oh, this makes sense, right? Don't sit down all the time. I mean, if it's your job to be a hairdresser or um, toll collector or something, where you have to stand for hours on end, you better wear some stockings, and some um, compression stockings, right? So they put certain millimeters of mercury that are graduated from your ankle up to your, your knee that keeps blood moving in one direction. These are excellent, I think if you're gonna do something where you're standing all the time. And you might have worn these if you're a dancer just to, when your legs get a little tired, they, they, they can definitely help. But you know, medically, they can be used to prevent blood clots or, or edema in the ankles by keeping the venous blood moving in the anterograde direction. Yeah, so the, again, varicose veins are the biggest problem, but the, again, they're unsightly and they could lead to problems too if they get inflamed called the phlebitis. So they could use laser to remove them or tie them or strip them. Like you probably heard of vein stripping. It's really a cosmetic thing, but, but not only that, I mean, it can also help with um, stasis, right? And, and, and building up of blood in those areas. So, so I think we'll stop there because deep vein thrombosis is a really interesting topic that's very common. So we'll stop there.